So many people have been blessed with such a good life. They had good mothers and fathers, did everything they could, gave them the whole world, and everything was great. I wasn't so fortunate, and that's fine. But if it could help you to understand that there is nothing impossible with God, there is nothing he won't do. There were so many things that I was seeing and feeling, and and I wrote it in my book, and I wrote it how my mind had gone so far. And like I said, this is about 50 years ago before I even found the Lord. Uh, I could not function out into the world. I would be walking and, and talking just as normal as anything, and suddenly I would fall to the ground, ground right in the middle of Main Street. And I, it, you couldn't call it a blackout. You couldn't call it a pass out. I don't know what it was. But when I got up out of it and I looked up, I would see, just like in the movies, people circling around you and looking down on you. And they would be talking to one another. And some of them, because I lived on Main Street, right near doctor's offices, they picked me up and took me to a doctor. By that time, I was starting to come into functioning. And I sat down and began to talk to the doctor, and I knew I was speaking English to me, but he couldn't understand a word I said. And I knew I was speaking, he was speaking English to me, and I could not understand a word he said. And then I knew something was dreadfully wrong with me, that I could no longer communicate with any human being. And from there, I went into such a torment of bashing my head into the walls, bashing my head on the floor and banging my forehead as hard as I could to take away the pain and the agony of everything that I was going through. Sometimes I would throw myself completely up against the wall and many people would call that demonic. And you know, in a, in a way it is, but it doesn't mean that you are possessed by a demon. It means you are oppressed by a demon. demon. It means that something on the outside of you is working hard to get in. And that's what it was doing to me. And because I didn't know Jesus Christ, it had easy access to everything. Because my mother didn't know how to fight, they had easy access to her. And because of all the oppression and surrounding my whole life and all my thoughts and my feelings, it brought me nothing but torment and a lack of hope that led me to suicide. Because to live through one day was so traumatic that you couldn't even bear to face the thought of living one more day like that. And you went through this time and time again, day in and day out, with no let up and no ability to change it. With no hope, nowhere to go, no, no one wanting anything to do with you. And whether they thought you were crazy or not, it didn't matter. What mattered was is you needed help. And there was no one there to help you. No one there to, to even talk to you. So I went into a catatonic state. And in that state, you had to be led around by other people. Because you had given up hope in here. You had given up hope in here. You had given it all up. You got to a place where inside of you, you made a decision, why bother to talk to anybody? Why bother to even try to communicate? It won't do any good. It's like being in a prison that's impossible to come out, that's impossible to break down those doors. Jesus broke down those doors. Almost 50 years ago, he broke them down. Almost 50 years ago, when God the Father revealed himself in love to me and told me that he was my father, he broke those doors down. I didn't trust anybody or anything. I was completely out of my mind. And anything could tr trigger it at any time. And then I would go almost berserk. And then I would come out of it. And so, like, if I went to a doctor, they couldn't help me. And if they prescribed tranquilizers in the times that I was thinking I would pour them down the drain because I knew I would probably kill myself when I'm not thinking and it was it was years I went through that I lived like that and you want to know the strangest and funniest thing 
not funny, but no one knew. No one had any idea what I was suffering. I never told anybody. I never thought about it. I never thought, you don't hide it. You just don't think to tell anybody that you're going through things that are untold. And you would see things and feel things and hear things that would drive you out of your mind because it would be going on night and day and day and night and there was no hope. So I would lay on a bed to go to sleep and for months I couldn't sleep. I would have my fists like this, my shoulders clenched and my teeth clenched like that and I couldn't sleep. Little lumps would break out in the back of my neck because I couldn't sleep. I was so blessed and so fortunate that God the Father took pity upon me, that God the Son decided this is the way the things are going to be, knowing there was not a, a single bit of medicine, not a single kind of doctor that could ever reach me. And he cut through it all. Through it all, he said, Marian, I am your father. And then he talked to me about who he was and how much he loved me. Now, if God saw me in that condition and came to me in love, he spoke to me for two years and comforted me and helped me. And I have given it in other testimonies where the torment and fear was so great that I would jump up suddenly and scream. I would get a feeling of even peace would come on my body because fear I knew and understood it was my best friend. As long as I felt fear, I knew I was alive. And I knew I wasn't dying because I was consumed with it. You could feel it on my tongue. And so therefore, when God began to appear to me and show me peace, those were the times where I would just snap and run screaming because then I was sure I was going to die. Because after you plan to kill yourself and then you don't want to anymore, then you go through that. So I was going from one extreme to another. I did one extreme to another in my anger times, in my emotional times. Nothing was ever moderate or in between. Nothing. Everything was one way or the other until I met the Lord. And when I met the Lord and he began to come to me, there was nobody I could tell about him. Uh, there was nobody I could give an understanding for because they would not know or they would be sure I was crazy. <laughs> and they wouldn't have been at those years too far wrong. I remember we had, uh, we were selling something and, uh, a head of a mental institution in one of the states called me to see if they could see it. And I began to give him this testimony and he was shocked. He said, we have people under lock and key. We can't even reach. And here you are normal. And so he came to my house and he brought other psychologists and they wanted to know this big secret of how I became normal more solid in my mind than most people they ever met. And that's what they told me. And what they did was this, when they found out that it was Jesus Christ, they didn't want to hear anymore. They found out it went into the Bible. That was enough for them. They didn't need to hear this because they didn't need God. And I wonder if they're still around today or if they still know and understand. But I wonder if a lot of the doctors that saw me during those years are still alive. Because I know certainly they were positive. I wouldn't be here. In all their knowledge and understanding, they never dreamed I would be. But when God the Father brought Jesus Christ to me, I had a dream of the crystal sea. And my sister-in-law led me to the Bible because I didn't know what the Bible was. And she brought me one and told, showed me where it was written in Revelation about a crystal, crystal sea. From there, I got into Matthew. And like I said, I read it, read it 27 times because I fell in love with the Savior. I fell in love with everything about the only man in my life that ever loved me. The only man in my life that could ever do anything for me. 
I fell in love with him so much that I would have died before I would have done one thing to offend him or hurt him. Now that's true love. You would sacrifice anything to keep this only one true love in your life. You would go through anything if you, no matter what it was, no matter how bad it was after all that you suffered, you would go through anything because there was one person on this earth that loved you and his name was Jesus Christ. And I remember him appearing to me and he's appeared to me many times since then. I even saw him night before last when I was praying right there next to me. Anyway, he would appear to me, and I, I can remember, I may have given this before, and I may not have, but maybe it'll wake you up. He said, you see this mountain? And he's standing there, and he's pointing at a hill. A very green hill, but he's pointing at it and calling it a mountain. And in that instant, I looked up to the side and down, and all I could see was that mountain. To me, it was the hugest mountain that there was no way up, down, around, nothing. To him, it was a little hill. And he said to me, it's okay, Marion. You obey me. We're going to climb that mountain together. And then he showed me a picture of a woman and all this stuff coming out of her head that was represented coming out of her mind. And just one glance would be, oh, terrifying that this would be so horrible of a person going through, through that in her mind. And the Lord smiled again and said, Marion, that's you. He says, but don't concern yourself. We are going to overcome you. And I had begged him to never call me as a preacher, never call me as anything, because I saw so many run off with the Sunday school teacher, uh, women leaving their families, saying God called them, men leaving their families, saying God called them, all doing their own thing, claiming God. And I said, I don't want to be like that. Some of them serving the Lord with all their heart for 20 years and turning away, 30 years and turning away. And as I can't do that, Lord, I'd rather die right now. I would rather not do anything than for me to end up like that. And he sat me down so gently and said, Marion, if you will obey my voice and listen to me, I will fix it that your heart and I, I will work with your heart so close that you will never fall. If you will hear my voice always, now you see, I was fortunate because you see, I had known torment, misery, everything. I had heard every evil voice you could hear. But when I heard the son of God speak, I knew it was God. I had that witness in my soul and I could follow him anywhere. So he took a couple of years and took my mind and healed it, taking it right out of a maze. And he used the word of God to do it. And he said to me, you know, Marion, you see what you're thinking right at this moment? That's schizophrenia. He says, go here. This is what my word says. And I would go right into it and be led right out of the things that troubled my mother. And then he would say, you see what you're thinking and feeling right now, Marion? That's paranoia. But that's not me. Oh, here, this is what my word says. And he led me like that day in and day out for two solid years. And my mind came completely out of myself. And when the time came that someone I loved dearly got real suicidal, and they said it took all they could muster up to keep from running their vehicle over a cliff. I told them, don't listen to those voices. Listen to the voice that tells you what is good and what is right and what direction to go for that's God. Listen to God. And he led that person right out of their troubles. And all of you, 
can see it's obvious that you could allow the word of God to lead you and guide you. That's Jesus. Now, if he could take the worst case for I did not have a sound mind and he could bring me to the place where I could heal, hear his voice in all things, how much more can he do for you with a sound mind, with the ability to think? I remember watching people and how they were able to think and figure things out and plan ahead when I only lived for the moment of the, the emotions of torment. I didn't know how to do that, and I would cry. And I'd get on my knees and beg him and say, God, make me normal. Make me like other people. Please, dear God, help me. And you know what? He did. He did. He got me so that I go to him first in this old mind before I think of anything. I think of him first. And if I make a mistake, he's right there. He's right there to tell me, Marion, I don't hold that against you. I even know why you do it. The scars of your life, they ran deep. The torture you've been through, the cuts were so deep. And I understand. So trust me. Trust me and I'll lead you every time right out of it. And he did. It is phenomenal to me to know that the person who made the universe, who made all things, would take the time to take this one soul, who meant nothing to anybody but him. Now, how much more would he do for you? How much more and how much farther out of his way would he go for you? He said, "You leave the, he leaves the 99 to save that one lost sheep. And although many men without cause have hated me and cursed me, many people without cause had hurt me. All oh, means nothing. When I go before God, it's not even a memory. It all means nothing. I have one perfect purpose, is to see them get into heaven. What can I do to help them? I remember being so sick with lupus and the doctors giving up on me. Five doctors believing that I was going to die. There was no way I could live. So they said, there's nothing more we could do for you. There's no sense in even coming in. And I remember going before God and all the people at that time when I was dying were lying on me and saying, she's, she sinned so bad. That's why she's now dying. And they would knock on my door and want to do me the favor of coming in. And I would smile as sick as I was. And I'd say, you're looking for death, but he's not here because I'm going to live and not die. So go somewhere else to someone that needs you because I have Jesus. I don't need anybody but Jesus. I didn't give the hypocrite the power to come into my home and take care of me. I let Jesus take care of me. But I didn't hate them. I didn't fight them. I didn't do one thing. I went before God and I will never forget it. And I held up my hand and I said, Jesus, put it in my hand to help them. And he knew I meant to help them come out of what they've been doing and how they've been hurting themselves and how to help them to come to the place with Christ that they need to be so no one goes to hell. He knew what I meant. And suddenly he came straight through the wall. I had no one to pray for me. I could not see his face, but I felt his robe in his hand. And the tremendous power of God surged through every atom of my being. And he completely healed me in a second. And people that saw me five minutes before that, ten minutes before that, even a day before that, knew I was completely healed of the lupus, fibromyalgia, osteoporosis, and other things. And he took me off my deathbed for another time. And he has many times taken me off my deathbed. Why would he do that? Why would he trouble for that? 
I am telling you, he didn't do that for me because I'm so special. He did that for you. He did that so I can tell you he's for real. He's right there next to you. He loves you so much. But he loves you. Don't you think that that God that loves you would want you to love him back? Don't you think that he would, in his heart, crave for your love? Crave for you to never want to hurt him? To never want to go against him? He created you. Don't you think he knows that a human being craves that kind of love? It's not the church you go to. It's not your pastor. It's not the people that you're with and love. It's not your family. It's not your generations. His name is Jesus Christ. And you can find him in the word of God. The one that they spit on. The word that they tramp on. The one that says that, well, we all have to sin. We all have to do it. No, we don't. If we really love God, no, we don't. If we really want to bring glory to his name, no, we don't. We don't have to do those things. My prayers have been for people just like you. Just like you. Because you're just like me. I am as human as you are. Sure, a lot of my messages seem so strong. But they are never intended in condemnation. They are always intended for conviction. So that you may repent and turn away. If you don't have the power to do it, you have the power to pray. And ask God for his grace. For Jesus Christ earned the power for you to have favor from him to lift you out of it. Not twist and turn it into what you want. Not twist and turn it. You can't take God and twist and turn him to suit your own purposes and then claim God loves you and show everybody, oh, God loves you, but you're doing every demonic thing there is. Oh, God loves you, but you're sleeping with another man who's not your husband. Oh, God really loves you, and, and you're going to present God to the man you're sleeping with. I think that's rather ignorant. You're only deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving God. You're not deceiving the people around you, for they all know who you are. They may not admit it, just like those people. They know that there are only two genders. They know what is good for you and what is bad for you. And they want you in the bad so that you would be equal and accept them. They want desperately to be accepted in the wrong. And those of you who condemn them, you better read Romans chapter 2 because you're doing the same things they do. A reprobate mind is given up to the sin. You want that sin? God says, okay, go get it. You think he wants people who don't want him? Strong delusion comes. It literally comes when the Spirit of God comes down in a church and you are on a, an emotional high and you know and you go back home and you live like a demon out of hell, your mind and heart thinks wrong. But yet you say, God blessed me. God came to me and he blessed me. Oh, I just loved the message that was preached to me. Who are you kidding? You think you're going to be able to continue? You're going to stand before God. You think your mouth is going to open and defend yourself? You think your mouth is going to open and say, but God, you're not going to get that opportunity. Because he said some won't even come to the judgment. And you know why? Because they do not believe and receive the love of the truth. I'm speaking the truth to you. You don't have to love me. Love the truth. For he is Jesus. Jesus is the truth, the life, and the way. I won't tell you any different. I don't care how many millions you have. I don't care how many millions of followers you, followers you have. I will not lie to you. I will not tell you that if you do this, you will receive a blessing. I will not even tell you if you receive me, you will receive a blessing. Because I don't know where you're at. I don't know. I am not God and I won't take his place. I won't tell you who you are. God will. Go to him. Go to him before it's too late. Go to him because 
Here and now, judgment is nothing more than correction. Judgment is giving the power for God to judge you so that you have time with him to get rid of it, to repent of it. But if you cross over into the hereafter, it is no longer correction. It enters into eternal judgment. And that is what the Lord says. Let he that is righteous be righteous still. Let he that is unjust be unjust still. It goes on. And it goes on into the next life. And you never know when he's coming for you. That's not to frighten you. That's to wake you up and help you to understand what life is all about. Life is Jesus Christ. Live him. Take him with you. Live him. Don't hide from him. Don't run from him. Go before him. Run to him. For he will have open arms of love. Nothing more and nothing less.